Hello and welcome to Talk from Superheroes. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Rivemi. And I'm Diana McCullum. And you're listening to Talk from Superheroes, where every week we discuss a piece of superhero television or film. Uh, and this week on the podcast, we are talking about Batman Returns. The holiday classic from the master of Christmas himself, Tim Burton, as we all know. The master, you know what? Sure, yeah, master. I was being sarcastic. Yeah. Uh, the, the person who likes Christmas... Question mark? No, he likes Halloween. Mm. That's why he did Nightmare Before Christmas. He likes gothic things. I have no idea why this movie's set at Christmas. Right. Does Tim Burton like or hate Christmas is actually a good question that I'm not mm. entirely sure of until you bring it up just now. That is a good question. I don't know what other movies he's done that have had any take are, on yeah, Christmas. Yeah, fair enough. What are his personal feelings on Christmas? This seemed to be more of a movie focused on having a big tree and not so much about being about Christmas. Really, just ne- they just needed a tree lighting ceremony like three times. Uh, I mean, Christmas comes up a few different times here. Mm. There's, I, I don't know if it has a theme, I but know. I think it's more, more. Uh, I think there's more Christmas reference than just the tree lighting ceremony. There's a few more. There's presents and stuff. Not a single Santa. Oh no, they beat up a Santa early on. That was funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, never mind. They beat up a Santa. Yeah, I still don't know. Still don't know what Burton's feelings on Christmas are. Love it. <laughs> I don't know Hate if it, it. I don't know if he's exploring his own feelings on Christmas, mm. but or Gotham's feelings on Christmas, which yeah. is Santa Claus would get beat up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is very Gotham. Gotham's gonna have a rough go with it. Gotham always does. So we're gonna talk about Batman Returns this week on the podcast. Uh, but before we get into the episode, we need to thank our wonderful sponsor of today's episode. One of our wonderful sponsors. It's tpublic.com. It's tpublic.com. Where if you're in a crunch, they're gonna have something you're gonna love for yourself or somebody else. Everything they make is so great, and they put those great great designs by indie artists on multiple things. On multiple things. So many things. All well-made, well-priced, shipped right to your doorstep. You can get it on a t-shirt, a hoodie. You can get it on non-clothing, like laptop cases, cell phone cases, stickers, wall art, pillows, lots of different options. So once you find a design that you like, you'll find it on something that you like. So uh, all of their designs, They're submitted by independent artists, so you're getting something unique and cool. Uh, Independent designs, like the one that I'm enjoying this week, which is of Michael Keaton Batman, and it's uh, him holding the fireplace poker uh, from uh, the the first movie, and uh, it has the, like, let's get nuts underneath it, and just, like, a big font. Be like, you want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. And I love that moment from Keaton, and it's a a great shirt. That's a really fun one, because that is an understated moment that's great in that film. It really is. It's not quoted or appreciated as much as it should be. So Mm. I respect this shirt for bringing it to the forefront. And it's oddly, for something that people don't quote or remember, very recognizable. Like, if someone was walking down the street in this Keaton Let's Get Nuts shirt, I'd be like, oh, shit, Batman. yeah, you want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. <laughs> like, you would right away, I'd be I'd be with that person in this moment. So I, I'm really liking this shirt. And it's, the designs of, design of it is really nice, too. It's well designed, and that's the thing about Tee Public. You can find deep cut references mm. that you're not going to get at, like, a big box T-shirt place. Uh, my shirt this week is called Pop 2C, and it's, Four images of the Adam West Batman and kind of the Andy Warhol different color style. I love Adam West Batman. He's my favorite Batman. Uh, R.I.P. I miss you, man. Um, So, yeah, good stuff. And as we said, you're supporting an independent artist. So just someone working from home is putting their designs online. And if when you buy one of their designs, they get a commission for their work. So you're really helping some people out with these purchases if you want to get a nerdy item at tpublic.com. So check it out over at tpublic.com. And specifically, check it out over at tpublic.fromsuperheroes.com. That is our storefront where you can see either the designs we just mentioned as well as a bunch of designs we've brought up on previous episodes, other ones we've never brought up but we just like ourselves and think are cool, some of them which we own and wear. And also, when you shop through our store link, not only do you support the independent artist who created the design, you also directly support this podcast as well. So it's a double dip of support and great people. So head on over to tpublic.fromsuperheroes.com. That is T-E-E public.fromsuperheroes.com. And thank you, T Public, for your support. Thank you so much, T Public. And now let's get into it. Let's talk about Batman Returns. He's back, baby. All 
right, so we have seen Batman Returns. Let's start with the over the plate question. Diana, did you like it? I did like it. This movie's great. It's a delightful little trip. What down a cool, lane. calm response from you. I think that's kind of how uh, Burton is. Burton is. You get you get this nice, like measured, like oh, I just watched something theatrical. Measured, <laughs> measured is going to be a description <laughs> that you use for Tim Burton. Yeah. Calm um, and measured. Calm and measured. You. Yes, I stand by this. I'm never stressed out when I watch a Tim Burton movie. I'm like, I'm getting exactly what I knew what I was getting when I watched You do get what's the on door. the label. You do get what's on the label. Get exa- but yes, I, do- I actually haven't seen this movie all that often. I think it's the Batman I've seen the least. And that's including like Batman 66, other Batmans. Um, and I don't know why, because it's very good. But maybe it's, it's also like a little slowly paced. So I think it's a good like once a decade watch. Because, like, the villains are so interested. There's such interesting interpretations of them. Batman's not in it all that much. And it's in, it's everything from the first movie that was good. Michael Keaton's still good. The whole aesthetic of Gotham and the villains and Batman are absolutely incredible. The props are fun. Everything is going on is, like, zany but not too zany in this cool, grounded way. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun time. I had a great time. Andrew, did you like it? I love it. Ooh, I love. Yeah, I think this is absolutely terrific. I, I, I'm kind of the opposite of you. Uh, this might be the Batman I've seen the most. I didn't know question that. Mark. Hmm. Uh, I, I mean, it would be a tight run, I think largely because this was a big every year at Christmas cable television played it in some degree. So it wasn't like a, a VHS that I wore to the ground or like a DVD that was a favorite or anything like that. Uh, but it was it was definitely one that I've seen a lot. I think definitely of of any of the other original Batman movies. Okay, so you weren't, but you also weren't me who watched Forever and Batman and Robin over and over again. So you only had like two movies to choose from. Yeah, definitely. Def- <laughs> you've probably seen Batman and Robin more than I've seen any Batman combined forever and always. And I'm proud of that. Uh, sure. Yeah, like this might be a Batman I've seen eight times. That's still a lot. And, or, you know, yeah, and some of it in the background on television. But I absolutely love this movie. I think it's it's damn near perfect and breathtaking in, in a lot of ways. And uh, although I would, you know, I wouldn't say measured to describe it. <laughs> I uh, think it's measured. It's. I think it could be way bigger. It definitely could be bigger. It is. I don't mean that as a, it's a compliment. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it is, it is. Definitely Tim, Mur- Tim Burton showing some restraint, and he is a filmmaker who often shows no restraint, and that's when things go, I think, particularly wrong for his films. But there is a level of, of restraint here. I think it is just this, this perfect mix of a lot of powerful figures all knowing what they want to do with this property and maybe butting heads slightly, but to make everything for the best. Mm-hmm. Like this is this is a Tim Burton film where Tim Burton clearly had power and sway and strong opinions, but the studio still fought back on certain things. Like it's a Burton film where not all of the actors are Tim Burton's favorite actors who always agree with every one of his directorial decisions. Between, you know, Pfeiffer and DeVito and Walken and Keaton, you are getting strong actors with a strong interpretation of their character who are bringing in their own thing and just not and not necessarily just doing what Burton tells them to do. It is just this perfect storm of no yes people involved in the making of this film to create, I think, just this this perfect, beautiful uh, collection of, of artistic minds to come together and make this. Oh, man, yeah, I will, I will agree with this, yeah. Um, my, my complaints are few and far between about it. I didn't give it a love just because, like, I do think it's a little slowly paced at times, mm. and, that would probably, and there's not much Batman in it. <laughs> so that's kind of keeping it from a love. But, yeah, it's, it's well-crafted. Like you said, every performance is memorable in this very different way. They've all brought something completely unique to these characters. And for the most part, these are the first or only second iterations of like Penguin or, or Catwoman, if you're counting like Batman 66, but they still made them so iconic. Yeah. Which is just because you're first doesn't mean you're going to be iconic. Yeah. And they really captured these people in such an interesting way that really kind of just sears into your brain like, that's Catwoman, that's Penguin. Yeah. We're done here. These are the these this is them. And and ways that I think are are universal. Like it it is timeless, maybe is the word that I'm looking for to a certain degree. As much as 
a lot of people have a different favorite Joker. Oh, yes. Nicholson's Joker is iconic. Like, if someone did an impression of Nicholson's Joker, you would you would pick that out of a lineup as you know which Joker it is that they're doing. It is iconic to a certain degree. But it's not timeless. This Penguin and Catwoman are both iconic and timeless, where you could just inject them into any iteration or reinterpretation or reimagining. Like, you drop these two exact actors' performances, costumes, and everything into the current DCEU. It works. You draw them as they are and write them as they are written for the comic books. It works. It is both iconic and timeless in, I think, a very special way. You're absolutely right. And it's, it's, they're lucky that it worked that well because this movie is so about the villains. It was a risk. It's not really a Batman movie, but the villains turned out so incredible that it doesn't matter. Well, well the same is true of the, the first Batman movie, Batman 88. 89? 89. Eh, just Batman. 89. The, <laughs> the first Keaton, Tim Burton Batman, it's a Joker movie. Like, that's Nicholson's Joker. It even starts with Joker's backstory. Like, it is the Joker movie, and it is such a bold choice to do that again. To be like, the, a Batman movie is not a Batman movie. It's not about Batman. And I have I have heard some people say about Burton's Batman movies and why that they work is that he was smart enough to realize that Batman is the most boring character in the Batman universe, which I think is a bit aggressive of a way to describe it. I don't think it's that negative towards Burton's perception of Batman, but I do think it is intelligent enough to recognize that no matter how interesting Batman is, and at times Batman is very interesting, he's not boring, he's an interesting character, but no matter how interesting he is, he has the best villains of any comic book character. So that's still where you want to shine the spotlight, even when Batman is great and Keaton's performance is great. He has the best villains and he's own and but he is he is so much better because he has the best villains. Like Batman beating even even Keaton's Batman, who's absolutely great, if he's just beating up henchmen in the street, we're like, who cares? It's mm. a fun little fight scene, maybe. But when you're fighting iconic villains who are complicated and complex and you see their interesting backstories, it is so much better. And I think I, I also wouldn't describe Batman as the most boring part of Burton's Batman movies, but I think what I like about Burton is he has no interest in exploring Batman or Bruce, but he gets Batman completely. Yes. He's like, I don't care about your psyche, which every Batman movie afterwards does. They're like flashbacks to the graveyard scene. They're like flashbacks to finding the cave. We're going to do Rorschach tests. Like, and like, or we're going to do year one Batman Begins. Like every other Batman is so interested in his parents and his backstory and just killing it to death. And Burton came out first real Batman movie. He was like, I don't give a shit. Yeah. Batman's cool as he is. I don't want to explore who he is, but I get it. I get who he is. I get his aesthetic. I get how he fights. I get how he defeats his villains. He's smart, and he's a good fighter. He's intelligent. He he overthinks them. It's it's kind of interesting to be like, I love this character. I don't want to delve into him in any way, shape, or form. I think he's perfect as is. It's bold, and it's wonderful. Well, it, it's bold and wonderful, and I think the other very intelligent thing that he does... And I don't necessarily, if, if Burton had uh, stuck with this, with the Batman films. Like he made a third. I, yeah, if he had made a third or a fourth or a fifth or whatever. And stuck might not be the right word because I don't think it's on Burton for leaving. There was a lot of studio shit going on and uh, a lot of cogs in that wheel. But if Burton had made multiple films, I don't know if this is a sustainable model uh, of how to tell a Batman story. Because I do think it works twice, and it is because of the villains he chooses and the understanding of it. Because Joker, in the first film, being very much the antithesis of Batman, it is telling the story of Joker, and to be like, if you understand him, you will understand the opposite of him. If you understand this villain, you understand the hero who wants to end it. This movie, as big as Penguin is throughout the movie, doesn't have that personal connection to Bruce. In the Bruce story, Catwoman is the main catalyst. Selena Kyle is the main driving force. And at one point, uh, Bruce even has the line to her where he says, we are both two halves of the same side of a coin. 
uh, or the same side of. We're the same thing, I think he said. We're, the, we're two halves of the same thing. We're, they're two halves of the same thing, and the Joker is the opposite side of the same thing, but it is two different ways of telling a story in, the, in, in Batman and Batman Returns. In Batman being like, if you understand the Joker, you understand the other side of this. And in this one being like, if you understand Catwoman, you understand the other half of her. Mm -hmm. which is Batman, and making that very prevalent and clear. Like, if you buy into Catwoman, and you buy into this romance, which I 100% do, then you'll buy into Batman. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there is a third iteration of that for Batman. As iconic as some of his villains are, I don't know if there is a third one where if you buy into the villain, we don't need to give you a Batman story because you will understand who he is just by the fact that he opposes them. I I love your interpretation. I think that was great. I absolutely disagree. Because I think the only thing that would be holding Tim Burton back from telling as many Batman stories as he wants is that each of these movies, and I think each subsequent movie, is an origin story for the villain in that movie. Okay. And some villains just come out fully fleshed out. You never get a backstory for them. And Batman's just kind of constantly there. So I think he could only go as far as how many villains he could do interesting origin stories for. Because mm. I think you can always find a way to connect them. Because if I'm going to be honest, I think a third Burton movie, they haven't seeded this into these movies, but would be a very interesting Harvey Dent movie. I mean, they did see it. I think Burton flat out said that he wanted oh, yeah. Billy uh, D was supposed he to wanted come back. Billy D to come mm -hmm. back as uh, as Harvey Dent slash Two Face. But not so much that Harvey's there, but the Harvey Bruce friendship. Yeah, okay. Bruce losing a friend to villainy is a thing that hasn't happened. An established friend being lost because normally he's just befriending Catwoman, who's like an evil friend right. who he's making. <laughs> um, so I think a Harvey story could be very interesting uh, in its own way, and I think anyone kind of just works with the right writer. You give Riddler a cool origin story, he'd be fun too. Um, someone who challenges Batman mentally, which hasn't really happened yet. I, I agree with you that part of the reason why Batman villains are so great is that you give it to the right writer, all of them are equally good. But I, I, I'm just trying to say that you give all of them to the same writer, and mm. there's only some of them that work for that writer's style and format. I get and what I, you're saying. I think yeah, that like, the style is a very Catwoman, Joker heavy style. I kind of get what you're saying. Yeah, like I can't picture a Poison Ivy story. Yeah. from this writer, but I can picture a Harvey and a Riddler. A Riddler I actually think would be very interesting as like a mental foe of what if someone was as smart as Batman but evil. Hmm, I can't picture a Riddler, but I, I can, can picture, picture a Harvey. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on the Harvey, though. But yes, these are wonderfully crafted tales about Batman and his villains, but mostly about his villains, and there's nothing wrong with that. Hmm. Uh, maybe Mr. Freeze? Ooh, he's so Could be a so good Tim Burton -y one, yeah. And, but maybe also we're just relating that because the Batman animated series Did told that so job. well. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a tough one. Mm, it depends on if you get Paul Dini, Dini to write a yeah to write a B Tim Burton movie. Okay, so we're talking about some general ideas of like general overview of the Burton of it all. Let's get into some specifics of this movie. Right. Of talking about how 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 it works or how it doesn't. Uh, Performance-wise, Danny DeVito as Penguin, he owns this role. He, I mean, everyone in this movie owns their role. I mean, Christopher Walken is an is a original character, and he owns his role. But yeah, Danny DeVito is doing very interesting things with the Penguin, which is not really a Penguin we saw before. Like, I feel like, like you said, these are iconic, timeless villains now. And because they're kind of similar to this in every iteration afterwards, like on the animated series and other things, I think we forget how kind of knew these were, these mm. interpretations. Like, yeah, this, this, I'm like smart, but I'm vile. <laughs> I'm disgusting. You're disgusting. And like, I'm, I'm a creature. I'm, I'm literally a, inhuman to a certain degree without being one of Batman's creature villains. Mm. Like, it's not Man Bat, it's not Killer Croc. They're not going for a body horror, maybe a bit of body horror, but they're not going for a creature villain. But he is a villain who has literally and metaphorically lost his humanity. He has, and but they do such a fine line of is he human or not? Because some a lot of the times I'm just like, yeah, he's absolutely human. He's just his fingers are just formed together. What are you talking about? You're not human. But then he's got black spit. Yeah. Which is such a choice. And in one scene, I thought it was just a mistake. Like, the first time it happens, I'm like, oh, no, his, like, lipstick just came off. And it's melting or whatever, like his black lipstick. But it's in every single scene, like, slowly seated in. And you're like, 
I don't know if you are human. Like you ate cats as a child. You uh, uh, I, you eat raw fish. Yeah. Like are I'm genuinely don't know who your mother had sex with and what happened here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> This is one thing that is a little inconsistent and bothers me a bit, which is that I don't know if we're supposed to think shame on his parents mm-hmm. for uh, abandoning a, a child who had some birth defect or or abnormality that they should have loved and cared for, mm-hmm. or if they gave birth to an actual demon, because he right? he has black split spit and green blood, and that's not. That is not so, that is not like that's not a like, simple that's something's fucked up there. Yeah, that's not oh you only have 3 fingers. What a shame you've brought to this family. You're like you're in a cage and you still managed to eat a cat as a baby. As a, I couldn't eat a cat as an adult. You sh- you shouldn't have teeth yet. How did you <laughs> live eat you came out of the womb with with black spit green blood and teeth to eat live animal. You're a xenomorph. That is an alien from the film Alien. Oh, I was gonna say he's like two evolutions into an animorph. Oh, he okay. He was like stuck. So obviously his <laughs> parents are both finished. animorph, or no, one parent's an animorph, so he got born in that shitty halfway oh, he's only a quarter of the animorph, animorph cor- cover? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. So he's like two steps into an animorph cover. Oh, that he is has- not where you want to be. <laughs> no. That is the worst fucking place to be. Not quite human. Not quite a penguin. Mm. He's the penguin. He's Oswald Cobblepot. Yeah. I, ge- I genuinely have no idea. Because you're right. I forgot his blood was a weird color, too. His like, blood is green. His blood is like, you're like a weird Vulcan demon man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I that is a little muddled, I would say. Because there are times where I think, even though we know he's the villain of the film, and I, and I don't think they ever try to hide that. Like, when he's trying to run for mayor and he's won over the city, he's never won over us as an audience. No. But I do feel like there are times in this movie where they want us as an audience to feel at least somewhat sympathetic towards him as an abandoned child, which I think is a very reasonable sympathy to ask of us as an audience, to be like, here is a a child who was discarded and thrown away, and isn't that tragic and sad? And it is. And then he is literally inhuman. And I'm like, okay, now I actually don't know because you kind of scare me you're eating live cats as a baby. Yeah, and the, I feel like the parents can't even decide because, like, if he's just... Because they, if they think he's a demon, like an actual, like, murderous demon, they do such a shit job of killing him. Like, you have not gotten rid of this demon in any way, but you also didn't, like, leave him on a doorstep because you just thought he was human and didn't want him. Like, you didn't want anyone else raising this child. You thought it should die. Yeah. So, but, like, you just threw him into, like, the tiniest stream I've ever seen <laughs> in a wicker basket, and those things float. No, okay. I'm I'm going to defend the parents on this <laughs> one. Because all right, I'm not I'm not I'm not defending the attempt to murder. I'm not defending that conceptually. But once you concede to I am going to do a murder, I'm gonna murder this demon child that eats cats. Mm -hmm. I also would assume that there is no way the wicker basket raises this child for a week until he meets penguins. I've owned wicker furniture before. Wicker has never survived as well as it did in this terrible sewage condition. How much water are you throwing your wicker into? Slight rain. (laughs) Uh, Like patio furniture that's made of wicker, and it's like, it's element proof. And then one piece of the wicker pops off, and then slowly, or quickly, the whole thing just dissolves. Mm, But did you have rich people wicker? Maybe they've got a different wicker they've than I They've got a different do. wicker. They're rich. They're not getting that Home Depot wicker furniture. No, the cobble pots ain't shopping at Home it's Depot. It's hand-woven wicker. They got a lady in the basement growing wicker. Wicker's never been as well-made, though, well, as that goddamn basket. Good to know for my future, future murder attempts. Don't use wicker. The wicker should have sunk? Or, All right. Or, well, the wicker should have sunk. I mean, maybe it floats, but it doesn't hold up. Mm-hmm. But in any case, the performance itself is incredible. 
The, be yeah. will, the being willing to go there to the grossness levels that he goes to of like, I'm going to eat a raw fish. I'm going to bite off a dude's nose. I'm just going to be disgusting, but still sympathetic, as you said. Yeah. Like, you still fear for him when he goes, like, even though I know he's playing us the whole time, I still feel for him when he goes to the cemetery and he's like, my name was Oswald Cobblepot. I'm like, oh, I found out. That's nice. I'm, I'm happy for you. Mm. You feel like he's really, he really draws you in in certain times. He draws you in, and you also get kind of drawn in, too, because he also gets drawn in to Shre uh, like Max Shrek's world. So he's also a victim to a certain degree, even as he is the villain and the one instigating the evil plot. Because his whole plan was to come out of the sewers, get the names of all the firstborns, and then commit murders. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the A to Z entirety of Penguin's plot. Penguin, when he leaves the sewers, had no intention of running for mayor or any of this power grab stuff that Max Shrek kind of puts upon him. So as he moves forward, even though he is villainous and a planning to be a murderer and presumably have done a murder, it murders in the past, he is learning his own name and like has to turn to his own crew and be like, stop calling me Penguin. I have a name. I'm Oswald. Like he's finding his own humanity through that. And then as it's rejected, when his crew then calls him Oswald, and he's, he has to reject his own humanity again, be like, no, don't call me that, I'm Penguin. Like, he is the victim of a journey, even as he's perpetrating the evil, an evil journey, which is why I think he's even more sympathetic continually, even as the plot goes on. Yeah, genuinely. I feel like if, I almost feel like, even though you're right, that was his plan just to kill all these kids, but I feel like once he found out his name, if he hadn't been pulled into the mayor plot, he might have actually just become a normal person. Like the city genuinely accepted him. He seemed to like having attention. He seemed to like, like just having, he seemed kind of over his murderous first child issues yeah. a little bit as he was learning who he was. So yeah, I think, I think without Max's intervention, he would have actually like turned around for the most part. And cause even his crew at the end is like, we're killing babies? At least one member of his crew was like, that's not, was that our plan the whole time? And, and, he, and several other members of his crew just abandoned him to be like, we're out, we're, we're out not here. ride or die with you. Yeah. We are some creepy circus folk who came along with you for some reason. We like a little mischief, but we're not here to kill babies, yeah. which I think is a fine stance to be on. I do have to point out one thing about his original plan, because you're right, he didn't want to be mayor. His uh -huh. original plan was- Do murders. Do murders, get the names of the babies, do murders. And I just have to point out, he did not need Max Shrek for this because they make a point when all the reporters are, get, are trying to get in to see him that he is looking at public records mm. of births. The, 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 the press isn't allowed in for his own privacy, but he is looking at public records, which is a thing you can do because you are a human man, the penguin. <laughs> Even if you feel a little monstrous, you can still walk up to the public records building and be like, public records, please. Please, let me look at these. And then you can go do your murders. You did not need this whole, if you didn't want to run for mayor, you didn't need any of this shit. He's very theatrical. He's also theatrical. In a, he's literally theatrical. He did shows in theater. He was he in a loves, circus. He loves a, a crowd. He loves a crowd. Lo on the circus note, mm -hmm. it's a little repetitive, I think, to it's, follow your Joker movie with the circus movie. It bothers me. Yes. It's like we still had circus costumes laying around, or like I just like circus themes, which I think he does, because then Burton also does like Dumbo later. Mm. Big Fish had a lot of circus stuff in it. Oh like, yeah, this motherfucker does love circuses. This dude likes circuses. He is a whimsical gothic man yeah. who likes circuses. Circuses. But, but when we just did a villain when you just, whose theme was a joker, a clown. Mm -hmm. And then all these circus people show up. I think what I'm most offended by is that at no point in the movie does someone say, oh shit, the joker must be back. Thank you. Nobody says that. At one point, the mayor says that crew of circus performers attacked us. This is before they know about the penguin. Just a crew of circus performers. And none of them jump to Joker. Oh shit, he must be alive. And granted, not all circus performers are clowns. 
but several of them are actually clowns in this one. A good chunk of them are clowns. A fair chunk are clowns. Like, one lady has a dog. I don't know what she does in the show. But there's... I also wrote down, what the fuck does this lady do in the show? Yeah. She's just a prissy lady with a dog. Her dog catches boomerangs? I think. And there's a monkey, which, okay, that's not, that's not, that's a general circusy thing. You got a monkey, you got a big strong man, general circusy thing, but there's still like nine clowns. Yeah, there's like acrobatic clowns, there's stilts clowns, there's just clown clowns. Yeah, there's unicycle juggling, clown. Unicycle clown, there's juggling clowns. There's so many clowns, mm. and no one is, no one thinks this is a Joker thing. Not a single one. Or like, no one is upset that the clowns are back. Mm. No one is having flashbacks. Because even like, because I'm, I will say at the end of Batman, his hand comes up like he might still be alive. What? Doesn't it come out of the goo? Or am I thinking of the wrong movie? You're thinking of the wrong movie. Oh, that's when he gets transformed. Oh, Sorry, okay. I'm thinking yeah. of the wrong scene. In, right. the right, in the right movie, wrong scene. Okay, gotcha. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous that they were just like, you Clowns don't, again? You, you don't get to be penguin henchmen. Right. Which I kind of get if it's on purpose. If you're like, I don't want people to know you're my henchman. Mm. So be clowns. And they'll think you're Joker's henchman. But that's not what this is. I honestly thought that's what they were going for at first. Because in the in the very first scene when like the mayor is like, oh my God, it is a bunch of circus performers attacking us. And the penguin comes out after like pretending to save that baby. Uh, and I think he, I thought he was trying to set himself up as the guy who stopped the last of the Joker gang. Mm. But no one gets that impression. No They're one just like, oh, Joker. thank you for stopping those unrelated clowns. I guess I like that they don't stereotype clowns in mm. Gotham. Like, no, you could be your own man, clowns. We're not going to assume you work for our only other rogues gallery villain. Uh, uh. It's a weird choice. But yes, I agree. I agree. On the on, to continue on Penguin for a mo for another oh. moment, the other thing that I, I is one of the that I don't like about his character uh, is that I had sincerely forgotten how horny his character was. It that's disgusting in a way I don't approve of. Yeah. He is so horny for not just Catwoman because not none of that is okay, but Catwoman at least I like get he's like alone with her a lot. She's in that very awesome outfit, but like. The co-ed who's like, I'm going to vote for you. And he puts the button on her boob real slowly. And then he just like eats his fish. And he's like, oh, I can't wait to have co-eds vote for me. And I was like, oh. Yeah, and he's like, oh, oh I can't wait to put my flipper in her. Like, oh, what are you talking no. about? Oh, it's all bad. And I think it's, it's all bad. And it's bad because it catches you off guard. Because it's halfway through the movie before Horny is introduced as a characteristic of him. And I don't get me wrong, I don't want Horny there from scratch. But it is additionally... Andrew is not advocating I, I'm not advocating horny. horny from scratch. But it is additionally jarring to a certain degree that we spend this half of this movie and he's just like, I do a murder and I live in the sewer. And we're like, great. And then at an hour 20, he's like, let me get a load of them titties. Mm. It's like, well, where, why is this now a, a character trait of yours? And why have you put it in just as we started to feel sympathy for this man? Yeah. Just as we started to feel for Peck, we get his real name. He's going to the cemetery. Now he's living in an attic. And he's like, and then like, you're going to run for mayor. And he's like, will I get a lot of titties? He's like, oh, I'm going to work with Catwoman because... She's a pussy. And I'm like, oh, stop emphasizing that word. And also, the fact that the only reason he betrays Catwoman and tries to kill her is because she won't sleep with him. Yeah. That is bonker sexist and terrible. And so, and I know you're the villain, but that is just so not where we go with these characters. Just like, Oh, you're just like a basic bitch, bitch villain. And you're going to kill women for not sleeping with you? And he has women in his crew. That's the other thing. It's it's not like this isn't the first time he's ever met a woman. I don't understand. Yeah, he lived in the circus for a long time. He has not been underground for his entire life. He's met women. He lives underground with women who he doesn't murder or get rid of or try to sleep with. Like, he exists on a daily basis with women. I don't understand. And he can't, he can't handle these topside women. They're just different. <laughs> they hit different somehow. They hit different. Yeah, the, him, 
just suddenly turning on Catwoman when she has done nothing to betray him. She went along with the plan about the Ice Princess. Yeah. And then he's just like, you won't sleep with me. You led me on. Death. And I'm like, fuck you. No Pe more sympathy for you, Penguin. Penguin is the only character in the film. We get POV shots from the Penguin. Like at the beginning of the movie where he's in the sewer and like looking out on the world and we just see his hands. We get point of view shots from Penguin because we're supposed to feel like we are the Penguin. So it's just really weird that, it's, that they, you throw these characteristics on them. I was supposed to feel, you, you wanted me to feel like I am him. And then you did this? No. Ew. No. No. Be good to women. Yes. Be good to women. Please do. I do like that uh, Penguin's dad kind of looks like uh, like a classic comics penguin as well. Oh, like the monocle it... and the like, he looks like when they do skinny penguin. Yeah, when they, sometimes when they do skinny penguin, like Gotham penguin, mm -hmm. who was pretty skinny. All right, well, let's take a quick break in the podcast to thank our other wonderful sponsor of today's episode. It is Manscaped. Oh, it's Manscaped. Talk about not being gross anymore. Don't, <laughs> don't be like Penguin. Get your stuff under control, all right? Penguin is a mess, and you shouldn't be, all right? It's almost a new year. Uh, new year, new balls, who dis? Uh, get it done with Manscaped, which uh, is a company that makes the best below-the-waist grooming products, which offer precision-engineered tools for your downstairs business. And uh, they've, they've helped over 2 million men all over the world get rid of hair on their balls, their business. Take care of yourself. And also just smell good, feel good, moisturize down there, clean down there. Like, 2020's been terrible. Manscaped is here to make you feel better about yourself in 2021. Like you're, you're, you're only start, got, you only fresh. got yourself. Start fresh in 2021. Start fresh. Take care of yourself. Do it for your partner or do it for yourself. Sincerely, like it, grooming, grooming your private, gr grooming your privates is going to add a pep to your step. Like it's not just about what is visually appealing or more clean for your partner. It is something that you do for you. And I really like Manscaped's products. Like they have stuff like their uh, their Lawnmower 3.0, which is a waterproof and skin safe trimmer, which will reduce nicks. And every single one of Manscaped's products, because they also have uh, an ear and no nose hair trimmer as well, it is fast, convenient, and easy to use. So even if you're already doing this type of grooming in your life, which I had been, this has totally saved me time because what used to be a like, oh, maybe once in, once a week, I'm gonna spend like a couple of hours having some me time, really getting my grooming down and getting, getting my stuff right, mm -hmm. is now just a like an every day or two, just a quick like boom, 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 Done. Mm. Tight. It's so fast, which is so important. But I think the safety is more important because I also shave my lower regions. And, like, you want it to be absolutely safe. So they got skin-safe trimmer, reduce your kit nicks. But also there's a light. Love the little light. Love, love the, little, the little light. Love the little light. You're going to see exactly where you're grooming. You're not going to miss any hairs. And also it's waterproof so you can do it in the shower, which, oh, my God, please clean yourself up in the shower. It's so much better for cuts. You're not going to get razor burn. Yeah. Oh, get in there. Oh, they... They've got so much good stuff. They've got like anti-chafing, ball deodorant, and moisturizer. They also have really great and well-made travel bag. They have fantastic underwear as well. Like genuinely fantastic. Like we have two travel bags under our sink now. And I'm like, these, I want to go somewhere. I want to mm. show people this beautiful bag. I love a company that just pays attention to making everything that they make right. Not mm. just the one flagship product where they... Manscaped as a company has taken every single product that they produce and that they have shipped to their home, and it's always the best version of that product and really well-made and something that's very impressive. They're not just focusing on their flagship and then some add-ons. Everything is meticulous and and smart and, and well done and is consistently impressive. So I really like Manscaped products, and I think you will too, uh, which is why now you can get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code TFS at manscaped.com. Uh, your balls will thank you, so get 20% off and free shipping with the code TFS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off, free shipping at manscaped, M-A-N-S-C-A-P-E-D, Dot com and use promo code TFS. So happy New Year's to you, your balls, your downstairs business. Take care of yourself. 
Take care of yourself. Thank you, Manscaped, for your support. Thank you so much, Manscaped. I think we need to talk about Catwoman. Let's talk about Catwoman in this movie. Oh, my God. Mwah, chef's kiss. So many good things. And it's not just the outfit. The outfit gets a lot of the praise. The outfit is phenomenal and iconic and so different. Without getting too much into the outfit, let's just throw a quick, brilliant thank you to everyone who did all the wardrobe in this film. Like, ev- everything looks perfect. Penguin's costume and makeup and, like, that, like, onesie he wears and the shape his body is great. Catwoman's costume is phenomenal. Every every bit of, of wardrobe is just on point in this film. Everything is good. So we will never compliment it again. That's all you get. It's dead. It's dead. We're to done with compliments to the wardrobe. But Michelle Pfeiffer is so wonderful. She manages to make Selena so different before and after her death and resurrection? Question mark? Like, we weren't sure if Penguin was human, and I also have questions about Catwoman. <laughs> Catwoman I have fewer questions about. I just presume that she snapped mentally and perhaps has some form of brain damage, which is causing a more chaotic lack of self-preservation behavior. That I would get behind if she didn't also genuinely seem to have nine lives. She is shot five times by Max Shrek. Mm. before she is electrocuted along with him. And you saw what it did to his body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then she's alive at the end. I have no problem with this You have no? She's wearing... None. She is wearing the thinnest outfit. She is not wearing a bulletproof Batman costume to absorb these five bullets, hon. Yeah, no, I fully understand. I'm fully with you. Why I'm on board with it. Please, genuinely. Why? Because I have no problem with it up until the shooting. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah, we'll get into the, the shooting. shooting. Yeah, up until the shooting, it's a fun, it almost feels like it is a joke to herself. Mm. Like that is something that she is doing for herself. She fell the first time when uh, when when Max tries to murder her. Mm-hmm. They show her like ripping through awnings as she falls to imply that she, it's slowing her fall and this is brutal but it's survivable. Then when she falls from the Batman height, she falls into sand or kitty litter. Uh, and she's like, oh, well, that's another life. So it's these survivable things. And then she's almost like creating a running joke just aside to herself that she keeps surviving and she's keeping count of it. At the point when she says it to Christopher Walken and he starts shooting at her, I don't think she believes that. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's an in canon thing. I think she has lost her mind and is just walking toward him to die mm-hmm. and somehow survives. That doesn't answer my question. I think I think there is mystery around one of these incidences, mm-hmm. uh, which easily, like if Burton were to make another movie or something, or if there was a third in this series and she returned, it would be like, this outfit wasn't just leather, it was Kevlar, or it was rubber to survive the electricity or something. This is, I think, a a one line in a Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman comes back other movie. I disagree for the double down of the shooting and the electricity. If she had just been shot five times and then electrocuted him, but she goes into the electrocution. She does go in there pretty and hard. And his body is dust. Yeah. And she f- went through the same thing. I just, I won't accept both. I would accept one or the other mm. separately. Okay. I would accept either shooting or electrocution on its own. I will not accept I was shot five times and electrocuted and I'm alive. All right, I know when I've lost, I got a conceit and actually <laughs> just step out on this one. You're right, it is fucked up that they double down on it right away. Right away. Right away. I, I agree about the three falls. The three falls are very survivable. The first one, she even fell in snow. Yeah. Like, that won't kill you. Second one, kitty litter. The third one, she does fall through, like, a glass plating, but into, like, plants. plants. and potted plants or something. Yeah. yeah. So those three wouldn't kill you. Like, yeah. they could, but if they yeah, don't, yeah. I not, it. Not ideal. Not ideal. But if they don't kill you, I'm okay with it. Okay. This is too much death. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you might be right. Yeah, it is. And not even like I'm alive, but I'm in the hospital, greatly injured. Days later, she's back in the suit on a rooftop. Mm. It's been a few days, and Batman's like, "Oh, she's right there." She's fucked in the head. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I love the mental break. The mental break is fantastic. She plays it so well. It's so believable, obviously. She's just been murdered and thrown out a window or attempted to be murdered and thrown out a window. And she portrays it wonderfully. And I love the script. So getting over the deaths. Um, I think my favorite thing the script does is the repeat of her going home. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is just great. You see her go through the entire routine of when she gets home, and then she goes through it all again after she has her mental break, and it's just a little bit different and obviously completely broken now, and it's it's brilliant writing and directing and performance, which is a great combo. Yeah, it's it, yeah, that's, it's just a perfect setup and payoff, and it really shows her snap. Uh, and... And obviously she works for, you know, a terrible evil villain of a boss who tried to murder her. But just this constant barrage of her psyche that they really take us on a journey with where nothing is is that bad. Uh, nothing is tr- is tragically, like, broken bad. I feel like in a lot of superhero media and movies, like, there will be a, like, and this character... Well, their mother and brother just died. They have cancer. They came home and their apartment is on fire. Oh, someone just shot their dog. Now they broke their leg. Can anything go? It's not that tragic and bad for her, but it makes the mental snap all that much more believable that it's just medium bad, but is this it's this constant barrage of mental harassment and almost like small gaslighting going on in her life just her checking her messages and her mother being like why do you have to live in the city it's not good and her just talking to herself and being like it is good and like then like the message just being like you're a you're you just got a crappy job as a secretary and her being like i'm an assistant i'm an assistant for the So, like, everyone in her life telling her something different than what she believes, and then, like, the advertisements on her messaging machine, and her trying to do too much, and then getting blamed in the office, it is just this perfect level of a constant barrage of mental harassment that makes this snap so believable in the writing of it. Mm -hmm. A constant barrage of just, like, tiny mental harassments against a woman who has no one to back up her beliefs... Mm. she's like she is lonely and she's alone and that's the problem even though you talk to people all day you can be alone your mother doesn't believe in you your boss is harassing you um we see we don't actually see it happen but you get a real feel for how much he gaslights her when he's like i forgot my speech remind me to blame my secretary like oh so that's a daily thing in your life where you blame your secretary for everything you do wrong so her her work office must be terrible and so yeah the fact that she's just completely alone and has no one so when she Someone attempts to kill her and she just goes home and she's like, I've only got me and I'm going to fucking take care of this now. I'm broken and I'm shattered. And there's really nice moments later with Bruce, too, where she's just like, I'm not really sure who I am anymore. And she's not just like a frenetic villain. You really get it. You're like, oh, she does just need a therapist. She needs counseling. Yeah, they both do. They both do. But Catwoman a little bit more urgently. Yeah. Then Bruce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, I don't know. I don't know if she needs it more urgently. I was going to say she needs it more urgently because she went from like zero to 60 really quickly, whereas Batman did it slowly over the course of 30 years. And then I was like, that's more depressing, (laughs) actually. (laughs) She had a weird weekend and he was like planning it for 30 years. Anyone can have a rough week. We've all had a weekend where like, I'm going to, clean the whole house and then you're like I'm gonna make a Catwoman suit like I'm just gonna have a project and go wild like Catwoman could plead insanity oh yeah uh, if she if she was caught and had to go to trial for the murder of Max Shrek uh, Christopher Walken's character she could plead insanity Batman does a murder he does not have the insanity plea. It is premeditated. You spent years of training. You built caves, equipment. You added cannons to your car. <laughs> like, there is no insanity defense no. for that level you, of premeditation. You ordered 30 bat suits. Like, she's like, I only have one outfit, and it's breaking. I made it myself. Yeah. Like, she is... Just off the cuff becoming a supervillain. Yeah. So so I do think Batman maybe needs it more therapy mm. more urgently. But they both need it. But they do they both do need both it. They do both need it. But they're also great together. Her and Michael This Keaton, chemistry, I believe it so much. Oh my god. It's And they really only get 
Two, two three. scenes? Three scenes. Three they scenes. get a very brief one at Max Shrek's office, then they meet on the street, and then the one at his house yeah. is the best one. And oddly enough, their best chemistry is when they're not in the same room together, when they both give Alfred the same like stuttering excuses to leave the mansion and leave the date. Yeah. It's so brilliant, and it's... It's funny and charming, and I feel like the Bruce parts of the movie kind of live in this like funnier movie. I think because Michael Keaton does like comedy a bit more, and like these parts are so charming and good when you're just like, oh, they're perfect for each other, but they don't know it because they're not seeing each other give the same stuttery like, oh, I like him, don't let him know I'm leaving kind of excuses. And both of them hiding their secret life, like when they're making out and they both hit each other's injuries, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's a brilliant moment too. And I think, honestly, uh, the scene at the masquerade ball is, like, when I, when I said earlier that, that Burton, like, gets Batman without exploring him, this is probably, like, my favorite. There's two moments in this movie that I'm like, holy shit, these are incredible, perfect Batman moments. And one of them is at the masquerade ball when they both don't show up in costumes because their real names are their costumes. Bruce's costume is Bruce Wayne because he's actually Batman. So he can't show up at a costume ball in a mask because your real identity is a mask. And they both even say that. We're they're, sick of wearing masks. Yeah, they're, they're both showing up in a mask to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're physically not wearing it, but they both are wearing a mask to a masquerade yeah, ball. Yeah, because they're lying about who they are. So Bruce Wayne is constantly attending masquerade balls in his mind. Mm. Every single interaction Bruce Wayne has. And Selena is the exact same, which is why they are so connected and why he's like genuinely right at the end when he's like, we're the same, I get you, don't kill him, like we can help each other. And that's a perfect moment, the call back to the mistletoe, and when they don't want to fight each other, it's but like she's like, Oh no, I don't want to fight you. It's her line beautiful. of like, Do we do we have to fight now? And they just go into a hug and keep dancing. It's you can feel they're desperately holding on to each other mentally and physically in that moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. That was also one of my notes, just like it's such a perfect condens like condensation of who this character is, who these people are. If this scene didn't exist in media and there was just some test if you understood Batman, it's, it's such a like one example quick answer to, yes, I understand Batman. Someone says like, do you get Batman enough to make a film? And the reply is simply, I have an idea for a scene where him and Catwoman attend a masquerade ball, and they're the only ones not wearing masks because they're always wearing a mask when they're Selena and Bruce. I'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, no, you fully... You get Batman. I yeah. don't have any follow-up question. It is such a simple, immediate, I get this character answer. Yeah. You understand Batman. Here's your movie. Have a good day, sir or madam. Yeah. I think a lady could make a Batman movie. It's 2020. <laughs> it's 20, it's going to be 2021 soon. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's 2021. <laughs> it's basically 2021. Women can do anything. Um, yeah, absolutely perfect scene. And while we're here, I will say my other, my other scene that I think is absolutely the epitome of Batman to me. Um, and it is when Bruce takes off his mask and Max Shrek says, Bruce, why are you dressed like Batman? This is my favorite reaction ever to someone seeing Bruce out of, uh, take the mask off. Right. Because every other writer or medium I've ever seen has always been like, oh my God, Bruce Wayne is Batman. But this movie captures so perfectly what Bruce Wayne works so hard to do, which is create a persona of an idiot who's such a moron that you would never believe he was Batman. Yeah. That you would never, even if you saw him take off a Batman mask and after being shot. And rip it off because it's poorly designed. It has to be ripped asunder in order to take this baby off. This explains why he had so many of these masks in the cave. Yeah. He had like 15 of them. And I was like, why does he need so many masks? I'm like, is this the only way to take this You've off? You've got to cut yourself out of that suit every single night. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Max Streck saying, Bruce Wayne, why are you dressed as Batman? is one of my favorite Batman moments of all time because it felt like really honoring what Bruce Wayne is doing with his real life to cover up the fact that he's Batman. Right. Cuz right. it kind of there's this there's this very silly Tumblr post that I really like which is like if you were working at a coffee store with someone who looked like Barack Obama, you would not assume that was Barack Obama. 
Uh, okay. You would assume it was just a person who looks like Barack Obama because they shouldn't be in this setting. That's not where you expect that person to be. You know a lot about this person. Right. And that's exactly what Bruce Wayne does. If you saw him dressed as Batman, you'd be like, he's not Batman. That can't be Bruce doing? Wayne. Or that is Bruce Wayne dressed as Batman, but he's not Batman. Mm. And it's my favorite Batman moment. Hmm. And it's so fast and it doesn't get enough love. And it's... It's so fast, and it's somewhat comical because it is Christopher Walken oh, doing, he's great. Uh, yeah, do, <laughs> speaking like Christopher Walken speaks. Uh, but it's, yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can fully get on board with that. It's a, it's a beautiful line. Uh, to go back to Catwoman for one moment, I would say one of my favorite little moments from this movie, uh, not a moment of dialogue, just a moment of visuals, is after Catwoman snaps and breaks everything and makes the costume and puts it on. When the camera pans out of her apartment into the alleyway and across the street and just that flickering hell here neon sign as she stretches in front of the window, that is a Baroque oil painting masterpiece. That is a single frame that is one of the most beautiful pieces of comic book art I've ever seen, including any comic book cover or spread or piece or panel, it is wildly flawless in its its framing, its color, its character placement. It, I could just watch that frame on pause for 15 minutes and feel more from that character than some people can do with a full story. I agree. And what is so incredible about this, because you're right, this is the this is the introduction of Catwoman. She's not Selena anymore. This is Catwoman now. And what's so bold about it is that he's so far away. He's on the rooftop across the street. And this is your first shot of this Catwoman costume. Mm. And he didn't say, let's do like a sexy pan up and we're going to show the costume. Because as much as she is sexy and gorgeous in this, yes. she is not exploited by the camera. Yes. The camera does not like stay on her hips or stay on her boobs. It's just full shots. And like, you're like, that's just how she looks. And she looks great. And the fact that they were like, this is Catwoman and her first sexy beautifulness, and you only get a glimpse of her. You can barely see her, but like her body's moving different. She's clearly a different person, and she feels better, and she feels more confident. And you're like, holy shit, how did, how did you convince the studio to let you do this as the reveal of Catwoman instead of like sexy upper glowing shots? I, I, I'm so glad you brought this up, and I frankly... I frankly think it's because studios didn't know to sexualize female superheroes yet. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> Obviously, films knew to sexualize women mm -hmm. in general, but I, I honestly feel like they didn't know that this was a genre or thing yet, so they were able to treat her like a human person. Despite wearing that outfit. And that's the thing that, like, Michelle Pfeiffer, obviously, unquestionably gorgeous. Mm -hmm. A beautiful, sexual woman. This costume, yum, yum, yum. Beautiful, sexy. And I remember this as being, like, the sexy thing. And in retrospect, watching it now... It is the least sexualized I've ever seen a female character in any superhero hero property. Like the only shots of her body you get are wide shots where she's using a whip or like doing a backflip. Functional wide shots that motivate the character and her movement and her power and authority in this space. I I don't think a single superhero costume for a woman since since this movie has been as neutral towards it in terms of sexuality as this movie was. I would say it's pretty close. Because, yeah, the I think maybe the scene where she's, like, waiting in bed for Penguin is maybe a little, like, the camera pans up her body. Uh, I can't really recall that one. I, I remember the scene, but I can't really recall um, that one but just that much. The, just, but I believe Just you. the introductory instance. But mm -hmm. then even, like, even at the end, her costume is ripped to shreds. Like, her mask has come off. And in She's, none of the slut, like, no not, slutty no, or sexy not places. not in, like, just in the sexy way. Or, yeah. like, no close-ups of the rips. It's, like, very respectful of this woman who's wearing a skin-tight leather outfit. Yeah. I adore it. Like, Anne Hathaway dreams of getting this kind of... Yeah. Uh, like direction in, in like the other Batman movies. It's 
Yeah. It's phenomenal. Like, they made Natalie Portman wear, like, a V-neck half-body zip to show enough cleavage to satisfy male fans in Avengers. And this one is just, like, her suit is ripped to shreds in functional places, like elbows, knees, the joints, places you would use while fighting. Also, she has... She has horrible napalm burns on her arm, <laughs> and we're not shying away from that. In fact, it might be the most skin you get from her in this entire movie. Like, that is bananas, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I will have one criticism of the treatment of her in this movie, and I only bring it up because it's a weird trend for Nolan in these two, not, oh, sorry, not Nolan, Burton. Yeah. Burton in these two movies, I, I don't know why, but in both Burton's Batman movies, they mention the weight of the female lead. Oh. And I don't understand why this is a thing you have to do. The first movie, Kim Basinger is like, because Batman's going to batarang her up, and he's like, what do you weigh? And she's like, 120. And then they get up there, and he's like, you weigh more than 120. I'm like, okay, I didn't need that line. Well, that's weird. And then in this one... Uh, Selena is like, the papers say Catwoman weighs 140 pounds, and they're wrong. And I'm like, why are both these movies talking about these women's weights? Yeah. It's such a weird flex to do twice. Huh. Okay. That's my only critique of her treatment in this film, mm. which is pretty small overall. It's just a weird trend, and I wanted to bring it up. I, like, if there'd been a third one, what was going to happen there? I'm trying to remember in the first one, is there a ditzy actress that like Bruce is dating at some point before uh, Vicky? I don't think so. Cause like that's that's the other one that's a little brutal in this is the ditzy actress who's thrown off of a roof who doesn't mm. seem to understand what reality is. Yeah, there's a ditzy actress in Batman and Robin. Oh, okay. maybe I'm thinking of Batman and Robin because mm. I'm part of me is like, is that also a Tim Burton trope that he just like thinks that female actors are just dumb in mm. general is that a weirdly insulting thing that he puts in his movies yeah but maybe it's know. just the way thing maybe yeah. it's just the way thing i will say since we're on the ice princess just yeah. quickly i'm not sure batman ever gets unframed for her murder oh no they still think he <laughs> they did that still think he totally did that murder right mm. but no like end of dark night like we have to hunt him kind of bullshit <laughs> he's just like yeah people think i killed the ice princess but i'm still gonna keep doing what i do one thing that I love in retrospect about that scene is that Tim Burton did sarcastically what Christopher Nolan did sincerely. Because there is a moment in Batman Begins where Batman, like, Sonic calls with his boot a bunch of bats to cover his escape. And in, in this movie, in Batman Returns, Tim Burton in the past was like, wouldn't it be fucking ridiculous if there was a bunch of bats around Batman? What a great way to frame him. If you were... <laughs> At a crime scene and you saw Batman and then a body and a shit ton of bats, you would hate Batman forever. Like he did, Burton sarcastically was like, well, how stupid would this be? This is a great way for Penguin or anyone to frame Batman. They're going to hate him because they're going to be covered in bats. Yeah. The people who are nearby. Yeah. And, yeah. and then Batman just does that to get away from Gordon, I think, in Dark Knight. Something, yeah. <laughs> Some kind of escape plan. Yeah, he, yeah, Burton sarcastically did what Nolan did sincerely. Mm, he did. And in a movie where Batman does ridiculous things, he didn't have a way to get rid of those bats. The bats just no. stuck around. Yeah, oh yeah. It's, he had no way to disperse bats. It's very strange. And what's It's strange and it's inconsistent because Penguin uses bats to set up Batman. Mm -hmm. Then later in the movie, when... In the in the final like third act, uh, the the actual penguins are coming back with the rocket strapped to them, <laughs> and that. Batman has the button that I guess fires the rockets and throws it to the penguin, or penguin has it, and then the bat boat opens up and a shit ton of bats come out, which caused the penguin to fall. Why was his boat? Why filled he, with bats. Why do you have a bunch of bats? Because he was in it a minute ago and it wasn't filled with bats. No. And when did it get filled with bats? And I would understand if it was like part of Penguin's lair was full of like leftover bats that he couldn't fit in the tree. Question <laughs> like, mark? Like clearly at some point Penguin collected some bats. Yeah. He did as part of a plan. So if Penguin just had some loose bats around, I'd get it. But Batman, does Batman routinely carry bats? Just loose bats <laughs> in, in a, a boat? Trunk? In, in you, a trunk or wherever? Own, if you try to rob my trunk, you will get a face full of bats. That's bad. 
That's not what you want. Although a bunch of people took apart his car and didn't find any bats. It's ridiculous that they could do that. That, that was that would have been circus people were like, we can hack Batman's car. Fuck yeah. That's dumb, but I was kind of just okay with the movie being like, fuck it, you just need to accept that this is... The movie made no attempt to be like, the circus people also have a background in engineering. And some of them... But like, there's no, there's no point where the movie is like, and here's the reason they're circus people. They worked for Ace Chemicals as actual like engineers and smart people, but the chemicals mutated them into the freaks in the freak show. So they joined the circus and Penguin's like, we can get back at society. Mm. They're just like, no, you know how clowns know advanced mechanics? But all of them, this is what bothers me. Every single one. Every, it wasn't just like they were like, we got one guy who's good at tech. Like this is the guy who does the audio visual for the circus. I don't know, we got, like, yeah. they, they didn't show up and they're like, we're here to protect the one guy who's good at tech. Like six of them were doing different tech things to the Batmobile. Yeah. If you line me up 10 clowns. <laughs> As I often As you do. often. As I'm I frankly want to do. fucking sick of it. But you line me up ten clowns. It's funny every time. <laughs> it's you every you time, keep laughing. Every time I'm getting I invite more exhausted every time. Whenever I invite ten clowns over, it's always funny. What if one of those clowns was like, I'm actually pretty into cars. I'd be like, oh yeah, well fuck. I mean, like one in ten. Sure. Statistically, yeah. Sure. Yeah, you're pretty into cars. I'm like, could you like could you like do something if like take apart a car, like fix something, change something? And be like, oh yeah, I'm pretty in the car. Like, oh, one in ten clowns, sure. <laughs> but if you line me up ten clowns, you're like, all ten of these motherfuckers know how to take apart a car. I'd be like, you're lying. They're, these aren't real clowns. Well, then this is this is a NASCAR team that you put in clown suits. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is- these are ringers. These aren't clowns. <laughs> yeah, this isn't your standard clown. Did you teach clowns engineering or me- and mechanics? Or did you teach mechanics clowning? Which, no offense to clowning, might be the easier path. It might be the easier path, but I, I don't know. I don't know. We don't get a backstory for the rest of these clowns. <laughs> is, this, is this an Armageddon thing? <laughs> Where they're going to be like, it's easier to teach miners astronauting than it is to teach astronauts mining? Like, which is it? Is Maybe it's the opposite of what you think. Maybe it is easier to teach clowns mechanics. Batman, Batmobile mechanics. <laughs> anyway, that was fun. <laughs> I hated it. Because my favorite thing that Batmobile did was when he had to do a U-turn. Yeah. And a big stick came out of the bottom. And rotated it for him. <laughs> like in a garage? Yeah, yeah. That was dope That was hell. Pretty, I think one of my favorite things was Batman's ridiculous face when he loses control of the Batmobile. <laughs> when he's genuinely panicked Oh, Keaton it. looks like he's shitting himself. <laughs> like no one told Keaton. No one told him that he wasn't going to be driving that car that day. <laughs> And Keaton's freaking out. And not we're not saying Bruce is. We're saying Michael Keaton. Keaton. Oh, because he's not even making, like, he's not making I'm scared as a character face. He's making ugly faces. Like, you know, like, the I'm scared ugly human face that oh, yeah. you never really see in movies? Because it's not attractive. No, he's fucked and scared on that one. I would also be scared if I was Michael Keaton, and just for a second, I thought maybe Danny DeVito was driving my car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what you want. It's <laughs> not what I want. I have no power. Danny DeVito's driving my car, but the first thing I'm going to think is pop in a CD and record this conversation. Yeah. Way to go, Batman. What I love about that, about how that affected my life, that scene. Okay. Is that, and I think a lot of people are going to be with me on this, but it will depend regionally, is that when it cuts to Penguin controlling the Batmobile in uh-huh. that van, Penguin's in like a little Batmobile. Oh, a very cute little like mall Batmobile that you could put quarters in. Every mall I was in for the next decade had that as a kid's <laughs> ride, which is fucked up in a way. Like that af- that affected life for 10 years. If I went to any mall anywhere ever, there was a child's Batmobile That was there, that was like the one in Danny DeVito's van with like a little screen on it. And I'm like, you mean the let's attempt to murder Bat? Like, that's a weird fucking toy to give to kids. It is because, but I think I'd have to try out every single one just on the off chance that one of them was going to kill Batman. Control the Batman. Because my intentions are good. So if I suddenly found I was controlling the Batmobile, I'd be like, oh, sorry, Batman, bye. And I would just get off. Ah, if I was okay. fucking up Batman. So there's no danger of me taking that ride. Okay. Because my intentions are good. All right. You're pure. <laughs> but I get what you're saying you're about how, like, like, that's a villain's car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the murder attempt. This is 
an attempt to kill Batman. Yeah, yeah. But it's safer in my hands. Okay, all right. It's it's not not. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> I, don't get me wrong. I'd been in one. <laughs> you know, like I'd ridden one of those bad boys. It's like any other car ride for kids in the mall. It just goes up and down a little bit. It doesn't do too much. No, and it really only lasts like 15 seconds. It's not I'm, a long ride. None there, of those things are. There was one in my mall that was broken, mm. and if you put money in it, it just basically never stopped. Infinite ride, I it like it. It was actually, and then it would be like too much. <laughs> <laughs> like, like mm. I'd be on it the whole time my mom was in the dress store, and I'd be like, this is probably more than I needed. <laughs> I feel like they have timers for a reason. Yeah, you know it's bad when a toy outwears a kid. Mm -hmm. When it's just like, ah, oh, this has grown boring now. That's too long. It's too long. Why are there so many penguins? Like, legitimate penguins in Gotham? Later. Yeah. I maybe... Well, no, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, later, they're in the zoo. And I guess maybe the penguins were abandoned to be there. Like, the zoo closed, and they're just like, you're on your own, penguins. They do seem <laughs> to give that impression. That, that they, they just abandoned that they the penguins. They closed the zoo suddenly one day with all of the animals still in it, I guess. Which is a nice parallel to what happens to Oswald, who is just oh, abandoned by abandoned. his parents. Okay. But... I don't know if this zoo has been closed for 33 years because there are penguins in the sewer 33 years ago. They raised Cobblepot. They raised him. They, they saved found his the life. wicker basket. Somehow, I don't know somehow how. a bunch of penguins raised. I don't know how they opened it because there's like a big chain on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keeping it closed. They then fed a child. They fed him? Taught him human speech. Well, I, th I feel like he probably didn't learn, learn human speech until he went to the circus. Okay. But at some point, like, they had to, like, release him into the circus. Like, yeah. they kept him alive enough that he could go above. And they, as penguins living in a city, procreated and, like, stayed alive. Like, they've got... Secretly. Secretly. And the movie drops this on us too quick, too late. Because for the first half of the movie, Penguin is a guy who lives in the sewers. And he's in the sewers. And the movie is just like, you know about sewer penguins? And I'm like, no, but if that's a conceit I have to make to go on the ride of this film, there's sewer penguins. In the sewers of some cities, there are penguins. And then the last act of the movie is then very suddenly like, it's an Arctic exhibit at a zoo. There's not just sewer penguins. <laughs> Don't be weird. But at this point, I'm like, the penguins are in battle armor shooting rockets. Why are you now treating me like I'm weird for accepting sewer penguins? There's a lot happening, and I won't accept sewer penguins. And this is why. Because if a zoo is closing, there are certain animals you will just put in the sewer. The crocodiles. Sure. The shitty ones. Yeah. The dangerous ones. The uncute ones. Okay. The cute, non-dangerous penguins... People are just going to take them home. People are going to take penguins. I would take a penguin We're gonna home. are going to take a penguin. This missile penguin would kill me. Because if I was on the streets of Gotham and a penguin was coming towards me with a missile on its back, I'd be like, I got to go pet that penguin. <laughs> I don't care if it's going to shoot a missile into my face. I, I can't got, not. I, what, when am I going to get to pet a penguin There's again? just a bunch of them in the wild, and they're super domesticated and chill. Oh, they're so chill. They will give you a funeral when you die. That was too much. <laughs> that was too, they can raise a baby, but they can't give it a funeral. Raising the baby? <laughs> At least this movie had the common decency to raise that baby off screen from penguins. But when the penguins on screen give Oswald Cobblepot <laughs> a fucking funeral, that is too much for me. That's when old Andrew checks out. I don't even mind that they gave him a funeral. But I will say that raising something is inherently instinctive, so it makes more sense. Because mm -hmm. I don't think funerals are instinctive. <laughs> mm. Like, inherently, a penguin would feed another penguin if it found one, I think. Right, right. If it was, like, young and small. Right. But I don't think inherently a penguin gives a funeral. The reason I mean, some, some species do. I wouldn't be I entirely ele surprised. Elephants do, because elephants are great. Ah, uh, crows do it, too. Oh, crows. Do yeah, cross hold funerals. The only reason I'm against the, the penguin funeral is because he was willing to let those penguins die. Right. He doesn't deserve a funeral from those penguins. Yes. He betrayed them. And they weren't in it for the cause. He 
also off screen and on the subject of all of the people in the circus are the best at technology. <laughs> he brainwashed penguins. He brainwashed penguins. <laughs> he created little penguin brainwashing helmets. They're so cute though. They're super adorable and they're specially fitted to every penguin because some of them are different some sizes. Some are tiny and some are big. He And they made have little like missile guiding yep. things. Oh yeah, he, <laughs> he made a missile, like a, a launch system for missiles. He made missiles and he made penguin brainwashing technology off screen. Off screen, there is one super tech clown. Yeah. And I hope it's the guy who didn't want to kill babies. <laughs> and then Penguin was just like, death to you. He's like, yeah. I thought we were just hacking Batmobiles. And he's like, I make you the special umbrellas and <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah, the special umbrellas. Someone's got to make them the special umbrellas. Mm -hmm. And I think the best part of the of the penguin funeral is that even Batman was like, what the fuck is happening during the penguin funeral? <laughs> that is great. <laughs> because Batman has seen some shit. Wait, too much, yeah. Too much. So for even Batman to be like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. And those weren't like not brainwashed penguins because they didn't have the helmets on. Yeah, yeah, no. Those were free will penguins. And even if they had the penguins on, Batman had jammed the penguin signal. Jammed it. So that, that's a that, that was a by choice funeral. <laughs> they chose. They chose to have a funeral for that man. Or what I choose to believe, because Penguin was mean to them, they were making sure he was dead. And like, we're gonna drown this fucker. Mm. Let's put him in the water. All right, they're like, fuck this guy. He was gonna fuck kill this us. Guy. Yeah. He might not be dead yet. Fuck out of here. This is our sanctuary. Sick to the bottom. Mm, okay. So he was either a funeral or they were saving his or they or they were killing him. Interesting. Interesting. I would say uh, like the last the last point or two that I want to make on uh, on Batman Returns is that I I really like and I know you very rarely notice music, but you know the great. Oh, the music's uh, incredible. And not only is the music incredible, this movie does a really good job of playing with loud and quiet. Uh, a lot of superhero movies will be too loud, too much, where it's all soundtrack or explosions. And if nothing is quiet, nothing is loud. It becomes all washed out. This movie does a really good job of like hitting you with that booming score, uh, that very iconic Danny Elfman Batman theme, and then going into just pure dialogue, just pure no sounds, no footsteps, no mixing of audio of any kind, just clean, unadulterated dialogue. And I really like that up and down the levels that this movie has, which seems like such a basic bitch compliment to give a movie to be like, sometimes it's loud and has music and sometimes people talk. <laughs> but it is oddly a step that a lot of movies, particularly in the superhero genre, seem to forget. That if everything is loud, nothing is loud. You need to get quiet sometimes. Yeah, you want the themes, the musical themes, to feel important and to kick in at important moments. You can't just have it through the entire thing. Mm. Or else it means nothing. For my last moment, my last comment on Batman Returns, I will say, find it upsetting that Catwoman never lands on her feet. Mm. Cats are supposed to land on her feet. She falls to her death three times. Ooh. And I will leave you on that. But she doesn't. But she, she doesn't, doesn't land on her feet, though. She does a lot of backflips, which is landing on her feet. Oh, those are backflips. The, the those are little jumps. The saying, the little jumps. The saying implies if you trip someone or throw them, they will land on their feet. Mm. Not if they choose to do a backflip. You don't know. I don't know. I don't know a lot about cats, but I just feel like I'd like to see her land on her feet just once. Maybe that's what happened at the end when she lived. She mm. finally landed on her feet. I hope that that's the case. Yeah, she, well, she didn't even fall, but she landed on her feet on a piece of rubber that prevented her from being electrocuted. We'll never know. We'll never know. How I really, woman survived this movie. I really do love this movie. It's, it's one of the best things that, uh, that of, of what I've seen of Tim Burton's work, one of the best pieces of Tim Burton's work, because Tim Burton is one of those filmmakers who, at his best, and I think when we discussed Darkman on the podcast, mm. Sam Raimi is another filmmaker like this, where at their best, one of the reasons why they're suited for the superhero genre is that they do things very big and body and like over the top and large and these nice set pieces that feel like they should be theater. Mm. And Burton, like Raimi, when doing the superhero genre right, it feels like a stage production. It feels like these gorgeous sets in a, in a theater piece. Like Catwoman's apartment 
is a set. Like, I would see a play where it's her delivering these monologues and these lines of her losing her sanity from the window of her apartment. Like, that is just a gorgeous single-shot character piece. And there's a lot of that that really works. And I think that's why when Burton works, it works really well, especially for the hero genre. I would say that's true, because one thing I did notice about this movie that is a little strange is it only has about five sets. Yeah. Like, we go to Bruce Wayne's mansion all the time. We go to the tree lighting over and over again. Yeah, we reuse the tree lighting set. Like, three times. Um, we go to Penguin's lair, and we go to, we go to Shrek's office, and we go to Selena's house, and that's about it. Yeah. This and could... that's the entire film. And, like, you could just have rotating sets on a stage and see Batman Returns in live theater. Yeah, this could relatively easily, and I say relatively because any player production in, in any capacity has difficulty and challenges, but relatively easily convert into a play. And I feel like the same is true of Raimi's first Spider-Man mm. uh, and of of a lot of good superhero stuff where it's it's big, it's over the top, it's it's stage, it's it's theater, and it's... Uh, but it's still got heart and groundedness to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's, it's just a character study. Yeah. Yeah. Of villains, but not Batman. Of villains. Which is interesting. All right. Well, uh, I'm feeling good on Batman Returns. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. All right. I'm feeling wonderful. feel like we really dissected some things. I had a lot of fun with this one. It's such a good movie. Uh, well, let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? So if you could change anything about this film, what would you change? Uh, but before we do, we need to give a shout out to our other sponsor of today's episode. I want to talk to you all about BetterHelp. Oh, I'm actually genuinely excited to talk about BetterHelp because 2020 has been a hard year in mm -hmm. a lot of ways and people's mental health have really taken a hit. And if you need someone to talk to, BetterHelp is going to be so good right now. Yeah, because what they're going to do is BetterHelp is a service that will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. Now, it's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. And counseling therapy, it is something that is going to help you, benefit you, and enrich your life. And it is something that does it every moment of every day. It is not something that fades or is, is trivial. There's a lot of fun self-care things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis where, hey, maybe you, maybe you have a nice relaxing bath and maybe that's part of a self-care routine. But therapy is something that's gonna give you the tools to take care of yourself every day of your life. It's so important, and I feel like everyone should be doing it. Absolutely, because you can have a breakthrough in therapy that will help every day you have after that day. Yes. That will have a continuing, lasting effect. And BetterHelp is great because, as we said, it's counseling done online. Um, it's very hard to get face-to-face -face with a therapist right now. This is built to be an online service. Um, so you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response, and you can schedule a weekly video or phone session, whatever, whichever you like, and you don't have to go to a waiting room. You just schedule it all online. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. They're committed to uh, facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed because even though therapy and counseling is fantastic, it is still something where – there's just going to be the right fit for you. And maybe you don't find that on the first go. And that is okay. That's entirely okay. And BetterHelp even says that's okay by helping you change counselors if you need. And it's more affordable than traditional online counseling and financial aid is available. They want you to live a happier life today. Yeah. And like a few people or a couple of reviews they've gotten lately from their incredible service, uh, uh, I've been wanting this for a long time. I'm so thankful I found my therapist. He really cares and is very invested in helping me is one of their reviews recently. And another reviewer said, um, I could not be more grateful for working with my therapist. I'm finally starting to find freedom from some things that have been following me for over 30 years. These are wow. licensed counselors who are going to help you Help you, help you feel better mentally. So check out betterhelp.com slash TFS. That's betterhelp.com slash TFS and join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And in fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. They are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So head on over and there's a special offer just for our listeners. You get 10% off your first month. So that's 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com 
dot com slash TFS. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash TFS. And thank you very much, BetterHelp, for your support. Thank you so much, BetterHelp. And as well, before we get into our final question, we'll remind you, as we do every week, uh, to send us over a, uh, a holiday gift by giving us a simple rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your fine podcasts. We're so easy to buy for this year, guys. Simple you know, gift here's giving. Here's our Christmas list. We want a five-star review Boom. on Apple Podcasts. Boom. And maybe... A tweet or a Facebook post telling your friends about us? Boom, boom, boom. Free ways to support the podcast. It's the only way that we find new listeners. We don't have an advertising budget here on the podcast, so the only way that new people will discover and find us is through great reviews, which move us uh, up the charts. And as well, then when people find us, they're more encouraged to uh, to read when there's recent positive reviews on there. And then sharing word of mouth, uh, social media, tweet, Facebook, whatever you do, tell your friends about this podcast. That gets people on board. So do that. It's free. It helps us out. That's going to be a gift to us. It takes two minutes, and we read it and appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who already has. Merry Christmas to us. We did see an influx the other week, the first day we mentioned this is a Christmas gift, and we really appreciate those ones that we got. Mm. They were absolutely lovely. We'll read a few on Christmas. We'll open them up. We'll, we'll stuff open them, them in up. our stockings. Uh, and as well, if you want to support the podcast monetarily and get cool bonuses for doing so, you can check us out on Patreon, which is a monthly subscription service where you subscribe to the online content creators you know and love, and you get cool bonuses for doing so, and you get to subscribe at whatever level you choose. So if you can't afford and want to kick in a buck a month, one dollar a month, huge help to the network. It helps. You're thinking to yourself, that won't help. It's Huge. like voting. Yeah. Everyone adds in, and it makes a big difference. Sincerely, if all of our listeners became $1 patrons, our lives would completely change. Absolutely, completely change. Completely change. <laughs> uh, and we'd have more of this content for you. So a dollar is definitely not too little. You can kick in a buck a month. Uh, if you have more in the budget, you can kick in more and get bigger bonuses for doing it. At the $10 hero level, you will get a bonus episode of this podcast every single month that's exclusive for our patrons, and you get immediate access to the full back catalog of those episodes once you sign up at the $10 hero level. Yeah, this month we did the Lego Star Wars special, and it was real fun. It was a lot of damn fun. And we had a lot of fun talk, talking about accents, yeah. and talking about character yeah. development, and is this canon? It was a delightful conversation about yeah, Star Wars. Yeah, and uh, that movie has some wonderful little shade to it. Uh, it's so that's got a, some shade, It's got some shade guys. in there. So that's a great, <laughs> that's a great episode. Uh, you can check it out over at patreon.com slash from superheroes. Once again, the $10 hero level gets you access to that episode. Uh, and as well, there's no obligations. You can change your donation level on any given month or cancel at any time with no problem at all. So if you want to give us a holiday gift, become a $10 hero level patron, listen to whatever episodes that you want to listen to. If you can't afford it next month when the bills roll in, you can cancel, you can downgrade to a buck. You take care of yourself and do what you got to do. So that's a nice thing about Patreon. You can Come in at whatever level you need. Change to whatever level you need. And it's over at patreon.com slash from superheroes. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash from superheroes. And now, let's go in for the final question. Let's ask, what would you change, Diana? What would you change? Quick one first. Uh, no horniness from Penguin. It makes me uncomfortable. Uh, a bigger one, though. Um, as I mentioned, even though this is a villain movie, Batman is really unpresent for about 45 minutes. He is not involved in this story at all. Um, and I don't really want to change anything about the villains, but I'm going to just insert Bruce a little bit more. So Bruce is at the very first meeting at Matt Shrek's office. Mm. Because he's also, he's at a later meeting at Matt Shrek's <clears throat> office. So why isn't he in the original talks about the power plant? So if he's there, he can meet Selina the very first time we meet Selina. So he can know her pre and post murder attempt. Okay. And then he's also at the tree lighting ceremony downstairs like he goes with them to the tree lighting ceremony he's a public figure he would absolutely be there um and then has to go change to get ready and then he's also because they do it again he's at the second tree lighting and he sees penguin come up and that's why he's questioning if the penguin is evil or not because he's like this seems fishy he's like actually there so it's really not that big a change but it puts bruce in the story a little more he knows the mayor he knows max shrek he gets to see penguin save the baby supposedly he doesn't actually do it um he meets selena before and then he saves her as batman later the same way 
Ah, okay. So he like meets her as Bruce in the office, saves her as Batman within five minutes of each other. Right. So it just kind of puts Bruce in the story a little bit more, but doesn't change anything about the villains. Hmm. So that's my my small but um I think delightful change. I really like that. Huh. Thank you. Because right now he's just like, literally when we see Bruce for the first time in this movie, he's sitting in a chair waiting for the light to go off. Just waiting for He's crime. not even reading a book or watching TV. He's just sitting there. He's just thinking about the time he stopped the Joker. <laughs> just thinking about it. So I would like him to be more active and more involved in this story off the top. The second and third act, he's in it. But the first act, he's quite absent. I think that would at least put Bruce in the story. Huh. That's my change. I really like that. Thank you. Dang. Mm-hmm. Andrew, what you got? Uh, I mean, I got to go with that. That's a real simple and clean one. For the most part, I really like this movie. I don't know if I would change much. I agree with you. Remove the horniness would be one. That'd be mwah, chef's kiss. If I was poking around and considering change for the sake of change, I think that maybe Max Shrek could be a cobble pot instead. Ooh, oh my. Because That's a big one. Because frankly, it's weird that Christopher Walken's son in this movie, who does a great job of doing a Christopher Walken impression, kills it. But he's kind of this big beefcake jacked shit house. His son is this Adonis of a person. So if instead that was a cobble pot and he got rid of his firstborn son but kept his second, <sighs> And that's why Cobblepot then wants to kidnap the other son. Mm -hmm. Why he's Mm -hmm. so mad, specifically at firstborns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, like, there's never an implication that he had siblings or, like, I don't know why it's this emphasis on firstborn son, firstborn son. You're an only child, I think. (laughs) As far as we know. know. You haven't gone out to find a sibling. Yeah. So I I feel like if, uh, if instead of Max Shrek, it was Maxwell Cobblepot. And that was the connection between those two. And maybe Maxwell Cobblepot doesn't realize it's his son, but still tries to use him and take advantage of him. And the anger that that would have then in the Penguin to be like, my father discarded me, but wants me when I have value to him, but only as an object. Like his good looking son is the one that he always has next to him. And in every scene, Christopher Walken has his son proudly next to him the entire time, uh, and this like very traditionally attractive, larger, mm-hmm. muscular man. So I, th- I think if that was a cobble pot, if that was his father, I think it was, becomes a lot more of a powerful story. And then it also draws more of a connection between Penguin and Catwoman, where they've both been discarded by the same person. Uh-huh. And the same person attempted to kill them both, literally throwing them away, only for them to come back Uh, and haunt him for it. I think I love this. I really do. Because Max, as wonderful as Christopher Walken is, Max Shrek is just a random businessman that Penguin decides to blackmail. There is no connection there. So yeah, some kind of more connection of why these two are working together would make so much sense. I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, have it all come together. Yeah. It all comes together. It all comes together. It's always more rewarding. Yeah. And then, like, and Max is a character who poisons everyone's life around him. Like, Penguin already had villainous plans, and Max gave him more power and made him more villainous and pushed him closer to the edge and the brink. And I feel like there's something to be said there to be like, the person who discarded you is the person who is causing you chaos and is going to tempt you when you have value back into their life, but they will discard you again, that there is a a pattern there. Mm, Yeah, Like Santa and Rudolph. Classic, yeah. Classic story. Like that one, classic Christmas story. It's a Christmas story. You're only useful when you're useful. Mm, You're only, (laughs) yeah, yeah, you got me. But yeah, that, that's no, just... No, that's a, a lovely change. It, re- it brings the characters together more. Ties that, it up. And that's just not even something I need. That's just me poking around and looking for change for the sake of change, which is a, a rare thing that I say on this podcast. It is. I, I'm surprised you're so smitten by a Burton because I did not get the impression you liked Burton I that am, much at all. I, I don't. Okay. I very much don't <laughs> typically okay. like Burton. I'm glad I knew that. But this is just the perfect the perfect fit for him. Mm-hmm. You know, as, as much as... As, as much as I've lost it on Nolan films on this podcast, I still think, you know, Dark Knight is is a brilliant Dark movie. N- Dark Knight is real good. Can't deny it. There's, there's something about ridiculous, pretentious, over-the-top filmmakers making a real hot Batman. <laughs> <laughs> just a real hot Batman. Oh, fuck, right what a hot Batman you just made. Shit. 
Yeah, I'm not gonna hate a director's entire body of work when there is uh, one or Good two brilliant in things in there. That's very uh, fair. I of you. like to think I'm not that petty of a person, but I might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, that's Batman Returns, you guys. That's Batman Returns. Uh, we're gonna be back next week to talk about the Mandalorian. Yeah, Mando and Baby Yoda, here they come. Mando, we talking about it. Uh, so we'll be back next week to talk about that. In the meantime, if you want to get a hold of us, you can reach me on Twitter at Ivamy, I-V-I-M-E-Y. You can reach me at Words of Diana. And you can reach both of us at From Superheroes. And we'll see you all next week. Bye.